Hi there, thanks for joining us. This is a Q&A edition of Space Nuts. My name is Andrew Dunkley, um, same as it was last week, strangely. Coming up, we've got questions to answer. Uh, we mentioned recently that everything moves in the universe. Fred said that. Uh, it's prompted a question from JR. How do we measure that? Uh, Rod wants to know about uh, the sun's fuel. Mick has a Mars hypothetical for us, and time permitting, uh, we will be looking at wormholes and gravity. That's all coming up on this Q&A edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And to answer all those questions and much, much more, Professor Fred Watson. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. Hello. I'm uh, well. Long time no see. Um, <laughs> so you're still called Andrew Dunkley? Yes, yeah, yes. Funny that. I'm, I'm called Ford <laughs> Prefect now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no one calls me Zayford Beeblebrox, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I didn't do it in the face for that. Though, no, you? that's right. Uh, if I was in Tasmania, however. <laughs> Don't go there. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no. I, I crossed that line. I apologise. Uh, what line. do they say in Parliament? Withdrawn. That's what, <laughs> that's what they Very say good. when they want to Very insult tired. someone and then get out of trouble. Withdrawn. You're ugly. Withdrawn. Yeah. I love watching Parliament on TV. Do you ever do it? Um, yes, because um, it's kind of almost part of my job from time to time yeah. to know about this sort of thing. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what I get out of it um, because I just think democracy is so broken, and yet here I am, captivated by these grown human beings tearing strips off each other over ideology. <laughs> anyway, whatever. Um, shall we answer some questions, Fred? Uh, Withdrawn. <laughs> we can do that too. We can do anything. I'll answer um, some questions, yes. All <laughs> right, let's, let's do that. Uh, our first question today comes from JR. He said, hi, I've been listening to your show for many years and for the first time ever I thought I should ask a question. Yes, you should. What's the question, JR? Uh, I'm listening to episode 441, he says, and Fred said something like everything in the universe moves, so I might as well too. Uh, is that true that everything in the universe moves? How could we measure that? Thanks for everything, JR, who's in Ohio. Thanks, JR. Lovely to hear from you, and I'm looking forward to the Bengals season. They're looking pretty schmick for the um for the football season in America this year. That's beside the point. Um, Not necessarily. They'd probably move too, I guess. They, so they, they move very, issue. very well. <laughs> very, very well. I'm not sure about the quarterback's new haircut, but I can live with it if he plays well. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Everything moves, yes or no? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, and how do we measure that? Um, so we we know everything moves just because of the, the way in which everything's formed. Uh, if you think of um, the Big Bang, uh, the sort of underlying scaffolding of structure we think was imposed on the on the universe very early on, which is this what we call the cosmic web, and we think it was dark matter. We think it was a web of dark matter, uh, which um, itself is moving, um, because uh, y you know the, the the effects of gravity uh, or the expansion are always to shove things along. And then more especially when objects that aren't made of dark matter, in other words, stars and galaxies, when they start forming, the formation process naturally imparts a spin to things. Um, and so you've always got this uh, in interesting balance between motion and gravity. The two go together. Uh, mm. it, it's almost a, you know, a rule to say you can't have gravity without motion. Um, it probably probably more accurate to say you can't survive gravity without motion because uh, it's, it's the, and I'm talking now about things in space uh, it's the orbital motion of something around a, 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 a gravitational object a massive object that that stops it from being pulled in to the center uh, so we uh, we are always if you've got objects in orbits if you've got galaxies rotating if you've got uh, 
even the, the, the you know the cosmic web uh, has vibrations or has uh, movements along it um, it's all in motion uh, so you can measure a lot of it um, JR's question is how do you measure it uh, a lot of it we can measure directly we can certainly measure the rotation of galaxies accurately we can measure the motion of galaxies in clusters accurately um, and uh, on the very largest scales we can we can measure um, what we call the proper motions of things they're, they're sorry the peculiar motions of things their their own peculiar motion uh, relating to the hubble flow which is the flow of the expansion of the universe which itself is in motion so yeah. there you go it's all moving it's all moving um it's like clockwork isn't it fred yes very much so that's right yeah want to know who's winding it up though uh, it got wound up in the beginning. That's the that's the bottom line. Yeah. So it's a very very once, long once lasting the, spring. Once the Big Bang happened, everything just happened afterwards yeah. by default. Yeah. So and it's still happening. It's still going. It's still moving. We still see remnants of the Big Bang. Um, uh, gravity's a, a big factor in the way things are uh, interrelating. Uh, it yeah, it's a, it's a it's a cosmic dance is what it is. Hmm. All right. Thank you, JR. We got over that one quick. Yes, everything's moving. Yes, and we can measure that because we can. <laughs> That's probably the answer. Uh, we've got an audio question, Fred. This one comes from Rod. Hi, Andrew and Professor Watson. This is Rod from Bloomington, Illinois. Question for you about the fuel reserves in the sun. If the sun is consuming 600 million tons of hydrogen every second, why is it not dimming? and shrinking. Does this mean that fuel is being replenished? Or are there some hydrogen atoms just waiting around to be burned in 5 billion years at the end of the life of the sun? Thanks, long-time listener. Always enjoy the show. Thanks, Rod. I, I really like this question because I, I find the, the sun to be quite a mystery because it's burning fuel at a rate that would you know, make um, a tractor uh, unhappy, uh, and 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 you got to wonder about how it survives for such a long period of time if it's burning so ferociously. Yeah, it's a it's a process of it's not so much burning; it's nuclear fusion. So I was about to say it's probably more to do with nuclear activity than it is a um, a pile of matches. <laughs> But yeah, six hundred million tons. It is a lot, <laughs> mm. um, and but but that's not just vanishing into the ether. Uh, what you get uh, with the basic nuclear reaction that's taking place in the core of the sun uh, from that six hundred million tons, you get about five hundred ninety-six million tons of helium. So uh, uh. The, you know, there's there's something still there, and the and the deficit, the four million tons of hydrogen, uh, basically are what's converted to energy. So it's that 4 million tonnes of hydrogen per second that makes the sun shine, uh, that makes it so bright. Um, now, that's all happening right down in the core of the, of the sun. Um, it, it, and the core is actually relatively small. Uh, it's the energy that comes from that that keeps the rest of the sun, most of which is hydrogen, from collapsing. Uh, so you can think of the core as being the furnace and the rest of the sun being, being the fuel. Um, and uh, basically, it's, uh, it, it, it will continue to do that for, um, yes, a few billion years yet, uh, because the sun is so big and its reserves of hydrogen are so enormous. Um, and so that's um, that's the basic process. Uh, the the I can't remember whether I said this, but the energy comes out mostly in the form of gamma rays and X-rays. Uh, there's other stuff as well, but that's the main thing. And you and I have talked before, um, Andrew. <laughs> What's your name again? It's because I call right. myself Ford Prefect there. It's just sent me off on a different <laughs> track altogether. <laughs> Um, uh, because, you can call me Zaphod if you like. Yeah, Zaphod. Well, well, the last time we spoke about this, Zaphod, we uh, we went into the uh, the you know the details of of why um, we get light out at the end, and it's because of all the um, th that radiation that's caught that's generated in the core, basically 
um, is absorbed and re-emitted by other atoms over a period of, what was it, 170,000 years or something like that? Yeah. It's getting up for a million years anyway, um, before it actually reaches the surface and, and comes out um, comes out as sunlight. So uh, interesting stuff. Um, but, I mean, the, the sun is stable at the moment. The balance between its... Uh, gravity wanting to pull the hydrogen inwards and the radiation pressure coming outwards is perfectly balanced. But when that changes, uh, once um, the sun starts burning helium, which will happen when it runs out of hydrogen, then the, the basically the nature of the sun itself will change. Um, yeah. and that's when we'll, it'll turn into a, a red giant star. So it will... When it starts to deplete its resources and changes fuel, it will expand, and then when that burns out, it'll white dwarf. That's right. Actually, this this it's the envelope that expands. the The nucleus will be collapsing slowly uh, during okay. that time until eventually it does become a white dwarf star. That's correct. Mm. It'll get pretty cold here. Uh, well, the way we'll be gone because the we'll be ab absorbed, won't we? We'll. Yes, so I, think, we'll I be... think it's going to be fairly ugly, I think, one way or another. Mm. Well, hopefully we've um, paid up all our electricity so that we can charge the ion engines to get off the planet. Yes. <laughs> yeah. By then, gonna, who knows? Going to need them. Going to need them. Yeah, definitely going to need them. Uh, thank you, Rod. Uh, great question. Uh, this is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Mm. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. I must confess, Fred, that um, when I prepared this show, I got everything locked in, all the questions written up, and uh, now I've reached a point where I can't remember what this question is from Mick. All I've got <laughs> written down is Mars hypothetical. So, yeah. well, drum roll, please. Yes, it's what happens if Mars gets removed. Oh, oh that's right. Hi, guys. Mick here at Kingdom Ireland. Um, hypothetical quest, too. Uh, they came up out basically because I was thinking about rogue planets. So my understanding is rogue planets are planets that have lost their sun um, and more or less have been ejected from their solar system. I think this normally happens during the formation of the solar system. I'm not sure about that. But it led me to think, what would happen if something catastrophic happened to Mars? Um, like something out of a sci-fi movie where it was hit by a massive asteroid or there was some massive explosion. I don't know. Uh, but let's just say ours suddenly left the solar system. What would be the effect on us and the damaged Earth? Would we start falling in towards the sun because we don't have any gravitational pull from Mars? Um, or would we be, would we move out from the sun? Um, also, what would happen to the moon? I, I suspect something would happen to the moon because there must be some gravitational pull from uh, uh, Mars on our moon and on our planet. Anyway, just uh, thinking out loud, not attending a voice uh, message, never done it before. So, Keep up the good work. Really love the podcast. Cheers, guys. Thank you, Mick. Love the accent and uh, great question. Thank you for sending it in. I was a rogue planet once years ago, Fred. I lost my son in a supermarket. Uh, there you go. <laughs> it's a true story. It scared me willies. Oh, but, um, yeah, I found did. him around the corner in another yeah. aisle. But, um, yeah, it's a, it's a terrible feeling. When, when you, you lose your son. When you lose your son, whether you're a planet mm. or a parent, it's uh, yes. definitely a problem. It's, so, it's a great hypothetical. It's a great hypothetical. And my, my science fiction brain is suddenly sort of venturing towards uh, Mars being obliterated by something and Deimos has, you know, making a beeline for Earth. That, that's on that's the first course. thing I thought of. Yep, that's right. That's your science fiction brain. Mm. Um, so... Uh, I think that the issue for me is that whatever gets rid of Mars is going to be the thing that uh, makes a big effect on the on the orbit of Earth, rather than Mars not being there. Um, I think you know if if Mars had never been there, 
maybe the solar system would look similar to what it does now. Uh, oh. There might be nuances of difference. Um, we know that the planets have kind of wound up in a in a particular order, which is governed by something called Bode's law, uh, and that. Is, has always been thought to be a coincidence rather than any real mathematical rule and regulation. But if you took Mars out of Bode's law, um, well, that means Jupiter might want to go where Mars is, or actually the asteroid belt would wind up where Mars was uh, in that you know, sort of geometrical progression, uh, and it would. Uh, so, so the the absence of a, of Mars would affect the Earth's orbit because the Earth's orbit is modified slightly by what we call gravitational perturbations from from other planets. Now, of course, Mars is not always on the on the far side of the of the of the Earth from the Sun. Sometimes it's on the other side of the Sun, so it's not always mm -hmm. pulling us outwards. It's sometimes pulling us inwards. Um, and all of that is taken account in the in the geometry of the Earth's orbit. Uh, I think the um, effect on the Moon, if the if Mars wasn't there, would be even smaller. Uh, there would be probably a tiny gravitational effect, again perturbations. But uh, the Moon is fairly tightly bound to the Earth in terms of its gravitational pull. It's only three hundred eighty thousand kilometers away, so it's it's hung on to pretty pretty well. Um, so let's. Uh, imagine a solar system without Mars, I think the Earth and the Moon would look much the same as they do already. And still be livable as it is. Yeah, probably, yeah. We might drift. Um, I mean, we might... Uh, you know, you kind of got to more imagine... Rather than imagine Mars being dragged away by some mechanism, which inevitably would affect the Earth's orbit, whatever that was, it would be big enough to to modify the Earth's orbit. If you imagine just Mars not being there, uh, rather than Mars being dragged away, then uh, it may it may change things slightly. It may change it, things enough that the Earth does get pushed out of the Goldilocks zone, um, mm. but wouldn't be wouldn't be that much but i think yeah that we're we're in such a sensitive balance of heat radiation from the sun and all the rest of it uh it's um it's a it's a very fine line perhaps between humanity being here and humanity not do we you might have answered this in a previous episode some time ago but do we know how wide the goldilocks zone is yes uh you can calculate that and it's it's doesn't go as far as Mars, and it doesn't go as far as Venus. <laughs> so you know, it's uh, it's I, I I don't know what the width is, but it you, you can calculate it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully we're on the better side of it. <laughs> we are at the moment, well, but um, we're in the middle of it. Yeah. Which is place so to be. in essence, if Mars didn't exist, things would probably be much the same as they are for Earth and the Moon. If Mars was uh, destroyed by something, evil force, let's call it, or no, the Death Star, um, that that might have a different impact on us because of whatever the force is that's caused this to happen. Yep. Maybe. Quite yeah. so. suppose it depends on the um, the level of catastrophe <laughs> when you that's right. size it all up. Uh, when you look at other solar systems, uh, their makeup is very different. In fact, in fact ours is looking quite quite uh, unique compared to a lot of the solar systems we're seeing, which have gas giants in close proximity to yeah. their parent star and the rocky planets are further out. Yeah. But bear in mind, they're the, they're the easiest ones to discover, the ones with ah, yes. gas giants closely in. So there might be a selection effect there. Indeed. Okay. Thank you, Mick. Lovely to hear from you. And uh, if you have, ever have another question, please send it in. Uh, we've got one more question I think we can squeeze in. Uh, and this one comes from Giergo in Slovakia. I have a hypothetical question for you. It's the second one today. Uh, if you would open a wormhole near an object with huge gravity, a black hole, for example, would its gravitational pull be transferred through the wormhole? Or would the bending of space-time just end at one end of the wormhole, and on the other side, there would be only the local bending of space-time. Thanks for the answer. Love your show. That's from Gergo in Slovakia. I think we've heard audio question from Gergo before. But, um, I, I like this one too. I love hype. You know, I love hypotheticals, Fred. Yes, yes, and um, 
So what the answer you're getting is also hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess um, it would be. Yeah, I think um, I think uh, the the question will be: Would the wormhole itself survive uh, having something, you know, a, a huge gravity next to it? Uh, the gravitational field would modify the wormhole, and my guess is the wormhole would fill in. Uh, because wormholes are just such a special case of of gravitational, you know, gravitational balances, if, if indeed they exist at all, and we've got absolutely no evidence that they do. Mm. So my guess is that, um, you know, well, the, the bending of space-time wouldn't just end at one end of the wormhole, which is what uh, uh, Gerico was asking. Uh, it, I think it, it, the, the, the effect of the gravitating body, supermassive black hole or whatever, would be to distort the black the wormhole and probably just turn it into another black hole which would be immediately absorbed by the by the big the, by the big one. It would be right, a, existing a larger. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Ah, that in itself sounds like a very feasible probability if a wormhole ever turned up next to um Sagittarius yes. A star, for example. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I be suppose it depends on wormhole. I suppose it depends on how big the wormhole is, though, doesn't it? Yeah, and I, I don't really know much about wormhole masses and geometry, but, um, yeah, if you had a big wormhole, I mean, we'd, we'd know about something like that. We don't know yeah. any any candidate wormholes anywhere. You know the best way to find a wormhole? Just look look for the little piles of dirt yes, on top of yes, them. Yes, that's right. They must be there, that's right. <laughs> yes, that's right. Find a little pile of dirt in space and you know there's a wormhole behind that. That's mm -hmm. that's the way. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a good question, but it's it's probably one that's um, in the realms of science fiction in terms of deciding what what, what might happen. But yeah, the, the, I think when it comes to uh, arm wrestles in space, black holes generally always win. Yep, they're usually the winners. That's right, especially the big ones. Yes, indeed. All right, there we go. Thanks for your question. Thanks to everyone who sent us questions, and you can send questions too uh, via our website, spacenuts.io. Click on the AMA link at the top to send us text or audio questions, or on the right-hand side, there's another button where you can send us audio questions. Don't forget to tell us who you are and where you're from. We'd love to know and who your favourite football team is. Uh, and uh, thanks to Hugh in the studio, who is actually out picking up one of the kids from school, so he's done a great job. Uh, thanks, Fred. As always, um, nice to catch up. We'll do it again real soon. I bet we will. <laughs> <laughs> I think we will too. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. For sure. See Sounds you, Fred. Good. Professor See you Fred Watson, astronomer at large. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for joining us on this Q&A episode. We'll be back again real soon with another one. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.